Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 9. So we'll just go ahead and we'll step through Matthew chapter 9. Once again, Matthew chapter 9 has several, several different stories in it. And we're going to step through and talk a little bit about each of those stories. But there's a lot of different doctrines also in Matthew chapter 9. So I want to look at that. So what I first want to do is, as normal, I want to just step through the whole chapter and just kind of explain, you know, each of these stories and the significance of the doctrine. And then we'll make some application at the end of the, the sermon this evening. So first of all, let's start off Matthew chapter 9. Look at verse number 1. And he entered into a ship, and he passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. So turn to Luke chapter 5. So this is an example of one of those, situa one of those stories in the Bible where we can look at one of the other Gospels and get a little bit more detail, a little bit more detail on what's happening with this story. So if you look at Luke chapter 5, at verse number 18, we see another account of this same story. And Luke chapter 5 and verse number 18, we get a little bit more detail here where it says, And behold, men brought in a, be in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up on the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto, the, unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. So the same type of story, but here you see, um, you know, here's a side note, first of all. So Jesus is in this house, and there's all these people just crowding around him. So these guys, they bring their buddy Who's, who's sick, he's, hand, he's crippled, he's sick of the palsy, the Bible says, you know, and he's in this bed, he's laid up in this bed, and they can't get him to Jesus. Okay, and so what do they do? I mean, now these are some friends. I mean, you want to have friends like this in your life, where you're sick, and they will literally, they climbed up on the roof of the house, they proceeded to take the roof apart, and then they lowered this man. So, I mean, they must have had, you know, ropes and things to, to do this, but these, these men took their friend and they basically made sure that they got him to Jesus. All right, so those are some good and faithful friends. I mean, they took, they, they were faithful in Christ, number one, but they were faithful enough to take action on their faith to get their, make sure that by whatever means their friend got to see Jesus. So they disassemble the roof, they lower their friend down to Jesus. Now, I mean, Guys like this, they deserve, some, they deserve some mention in the Bible. I mean, they're in the Bible for this reason. Uh, I mean, good for them. I mean, we should all hope that we have friends like that in our lives, right, that would take us up on the rooftop and lower us down, do whatever it takes to get us better, to get us healed. All right, so that's the, the context of the story. Jesus crowded with this big crowd inside this house. These men lower this man down to Jesus. Now go back to Matthew chapter 9. So, what's interesting in this story is it starts off where Jesus, he sees the man who's, who's crippled, paralyzed, whatever, is sick of the palsy, and he says to him, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, that's something to say to somebody who has a, a physical handicap, right? Look at verse number three. The Pharisees did not like him saying that. And the Bible says, and behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. So basically what the, Phar the Pharisees didn't say this out loud. The scribes didn't say this out loud. They said it within themselves. But Jesus, reading their thoughts, being God, knew what they said. And he says to them, Is it easier to forgive men's sins, or is it easier to heal men? Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Look, only God can forgive sins. That's why they said, this man blasphemeth. Because Jesus was claiming to do something that only God can do. All right, so they said, this man blasphemeth, in verse number 3. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. So how could Jesus have done this? Right, of course, we know that Jesus is God. We know that. But look at Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 32. The Bible says this, it says, And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, 
hath forgiven you. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. So God, the Bible says that God forgives you for Christ's sake. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look at verse number 5 where the Bible says this. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So it says this is, how, this is the answer of how Jesus could do this because he is the mediator between man and God. He's the only one. So he could go and he could forgive this man's sins because the forgiveness is through him and he is God and he has the power to forgive sins through himself. Okay? So he's claiming to be God here. And the Pharisees knew this. They knew when he said that your sins be forgiven thee, they knew that he was claiming to be God and that's why they called it blasphemy. Look, they didn't say that he was just making some crazy claim, like, hey, I can do this huge miracle. No, he was doing something that was telling them he was claiming to have the powers of God. Okay? Look at verse number 6. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. So now he says it again. It's going to make him even madder. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. So look, this is how this went down. Okay? He says to the guy, Your sins be forgiven you. The Pharisees, the scribes, freak out because he, they know that he's calling himself God. And then he says to him, is it easier to say his sins are forgiven him or to heal him and, you know, make him better, basically, Jesus says. So he's saying, what's easier, to say that his sins are forgiven or to actually heal him? Because if I tell Brother Matt, like, look, a Catholic priest or a Lutheran pastor would say, your sins be forgiven you. Can we see that happening? Can you see proof of that? I mean, we know it's a lie from the Bible, but can you see, can you, can you outright physically disprove that? That that man who just spoke something, I mean, we can disprove it from the Bible, but it's not something that you can physically see. You see what I'm saying? That's why Jesus said, is it, is it easy? To, he's like, it's probably pretty easy just to say that, right? Just to say that I, I forgive his sins. But it probably wouldn't be very easy to just heal him, right? It's actually harder to forgive his sins, but you can't see it outrightly, so he heals them and he gets up and walks. He's like, bam, right? I did them both. So that proves that the first one was done in many ways, right? So he's saying, which one's easier? You can't see the first one. They already called, you know, they say you're, 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 it's blasphemy because you're claiming to do something that only God can do. And then he actually just heals the guy and walks. Everybody sees it. So everybody believes that he's the Christ, basically, is what, is what happens, okay? Not everybody, but you see what I'm saying. He proved himself through that exercise, all right? So, I mean, just to rub it in and to show everybody that he can forgive sins, he actually heals the guy, too. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It, it's, it's a wonderful story. Matthew chapter 9, look at verse number 8. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. This is the call of Matthew in the book of Matthew. The receipt of custom. Matthew was a tax collector. Verse number 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a phys physician, but they that are sick. Turn to Luke chapter 18. So the Pharisees, they say to him, they see him eating with all these people that they're calling, you know, publicans and sinners. These were, these were people that were, you know, known to be bad people and known to be, you know, lower end people according to the Pharisees' view of things. And Jesus says, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Look at Luke um, verse number 18. And let's see what Jesus is talking about here. I want to show you that when Jesus says they that be whole here, he's talking tongue-in-cheek to the Pharisees. Okay, look at Luke 18 and verse number 9. 
And the Bible says this, and it says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So he's speaking this parable to prove a point to those who trust in themselves and despise others. They trust in themselves to be righteous, right? Is that going to work out for you if you trust in yourself to be righteous? The Bible says no. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. You see the same two groups of people that we're talking about in Matthew chapter 9. One a Pharisee and one a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Notice how he says that he's not like these sinners. And then he goes and he tells what he does, he, his works that he does. All right? I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, if you're a soul winner, you know these two guys. You've met these two guys several times. You've met the guy who's humble and is abased and knows he's a sinner and is ready to admit that he's a sinner. And then you've met the guy who is righteous in his own mind. That he, he's, I do all these things and I go to church and I, whatever. You know, and you've met these two guys in this chapter. This is the same type of people that Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 9. Go back to Matthew chapter 9 and look at verse number 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So look, were the Pharisees whole? Were the Pharisees whole? No, they were not, but they thought they were. That's the problem. Right? The Pharisees asked in verse 11 why he eats with publicans and sinners. But look, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. Saying, you know, saying that it is those that know they are righteous, you know, they're, they're saying that they're, they're sinners. They're, they're not admitting that they're sinners. You see, they think that they're whole. One, be, one must first be humble in order to accept Christ. That's what Jesus is trying to show here. So you must know that you cannot rely on your own righteousness, which is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. You must first know that you are sick before you realize your need for a physician, period. So you cannot get saved if you will not admit that you're a sinner. And you know that people will not do that. The Pharisees thought that they were righteous. That's the problem. And that's what Jesus was trying to get across. They thought that they were whole, period. It was very easy to show the publicans and sinners their sins. And Jesus, that, that's why so many of them ended up getting saved. The Pharisees, not so much. Okay, so that's what Jesus is getting at here. The, Phar the, the Pharisees thought that they were whole. They were not. Jesus knew that. And he was just saying that, look, the, the publicans and sinners, they admit that they're sin and they're humbled. So they're, they're easy to get saved because you can't get saved through your own righteousness. You need the righteousness of Christ, all right? Now, look, Matthew 9, um, verse number 12, also has a great application to the modern-day debate on vaccines, okay? Those that, you know, that's not the actual context of what Jesus was talking about, of course, but the bottom line is, when it comes to this vaccine debate, Jesus himself said, those that be whole would not need a physician, all right? So it basically comes down to the fact of, why would you give medicine, quote unquote, to a perfectly healthy child. Okay? I mean, and the Bible teaches that. Look, there's many moral issues with it. That's not the purpose of the sermon tonight. I actually want to refer you to Pastor Jimenez's sermon on Sunday if you did not see it. It's a very complete and full sermon on the whole vaccine debate, which is going to become very relevant in the near future, in my opinion. All right? Now look, I used to always say to people um, on the vaccine thing that the best thing that you could do to avoid you know, having to take vaccines and having to have anything forced upon you is to just not participate in any kind of government program. Don't participate in the government schools. Don't participate in government health care. Because look, if they're, 
if they're providing you all this stuff, they can make the rules. That's the bottom line, okay? And that's brought up in Pastor's sermon as well. So just get off the government, period. I mean, look, if they're paying for everything for you, and they're paying for taking care of you and your health and all these bills and all this stuff for you, they're going to make the rules for you. That's just the way it's going to go, all right? But look, here's something else I just want to add, just an adder onto this, something else that I'm seeing that's going to come, and it's this. First of all, the vaccines is not the mark of the beast, okay? I know that people are going to start throwing that out there, all right? It's not the mark of, a, of the beast, but here's what's coming, okay? What you're going to see, let me give you a little private sector um, vision here, okay? We're seeing a lot of private companies today that are very nervous and putting a lot of things in place to protect their liability because of this corona thing that's going on. And they're, they're putting out checklists, they're sending in health officers into offices, they're taking people's temperatures. If, if something happens to where they send you home and you're deemed to be sick, they're not even, they're not even testing people in, in many cases. They're just, they're reporting you to public health agencies and they're, you know, making sure somebody like makes sure that you stay home for 14 days, that type of thing. It's, it's become this thing where these companies don't want to get sued, that they haven't done enough to protect the employees at their company from sickness. It's a huge liability thing. Here's what's coming. In Revelation 13, when it does talk about the mark of the beast, and I used to talk about this with friends of mine two, three years ago who were concerned that the government was going to come around to your house, put a gun to your head, and make you get a vaccine. And I was like, you know, I just don't see that coming. First of all, who knows these days? But I don't see that coming. In Revelation 13, the, what is used to get people to take the mark of the beast is the ability to buy and sell. And here's what's coming, and I, I can see it clear as day. If this type of thing keeps going on, companies will require that you are vaccinated to come work there. I can see that coming plain as day. Hey, you have the choice to go work there. But if you want to come work here for the safety of our employees, as soon as one company starts doing it, all companies will follow suit. That's what happened with this checklist thing and all these different things. As soon as one company starts doing it, all companies will follow suit because no company is going to say that they didn't protect up their employees as well as some other company did. So this is coming. I already know that hospitals do it from the past. Like, hospitals are a business. They do it. You have to be vaccinated for certain things if you want to work at a hospital. All right? So look, this is coming. So when that comes, people are going to have a decision to make in their life. We're going to have to find out, you know, at that point, you're going to have to find out where your convictions lie <laughs> and how, how strong you hold your convictions. Because look, the vaccine thing it can get very complicated on all the technical things, but here's the, here's the brass tacks of it. If it's morally wrong, morally meaning if it's against what the Bible says, it doesn't matter what the benefits are or the risks are. or the. It doesn't matter. If it's morally wrong, it's morally wrong, period. That's it. All right? So look, these things are coming, and we're going to see this more and more and more, and there's some very powerful people and very powerful companies pushing these types of agendas. But let me tell you, when one private company starts doing it, they will all follow suit. Because it's all about, in America especially, it's all about not getting sued. Unfortunately, that's the society that we live in. All right? So look, those that be whole need not a physician. It's very simple. All right? All right, let's go move on. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. He's continuing this thought of the Pharisees, and these Pharisees are all out there, and, they, and what did the guy say when he was praying? He said, you know, I, I tithe and I fast twice a week. He's saying all these things that he does to sacrifice, right? He sacrifices to make himself righteous. But God says, no, I want to have mercy. Your sacrifice is not what I'm looking for. All right? So the Pharisees were doing all these outward things to show their righteousness. All right? To show that they sacrificed for the Lord. But Jesus says, I'm going to have mercy, meaning on those who admit they cannot do it on their own. 
He will save them. There's nothing you can sacrifice to the Lord to save yourself. That was the problem with the Pharisees. All right, look at verse number 14. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. Look, the king, he's basically saying the kingdom of heaven is walking around with them. They have nothing in, in, to fast for. They have nothing, they're in need of nothing right now, is what he's saying. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus Christ, is walking around with them right now, is what he says. Look at verse 16. We see another, or another uh, concept brought up in verse 16. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up, take, to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. The rent meaning the tear in the garment. Neither do men put wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. So, look, this is what he's trying to say, that it won't work living, you know, to try to live half of the Christian life. That's what he's saying. He's like, notice he doesn't say that the patch, you know, won't look right. He says that, you know, it'll actually be worse. He says that it will actually, you know, tear. He says that the bottle, it's not like that the bottle won't be right. He says it'll break. The bottle will actually break if you try to do that. So he's trying to say that you can't just live half in on the Christian life. We'll apply this. This is going to be one of our applications at the end. Okay, look at verse number 18 for sake of time. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her that she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. So now this is very interesting. All right? This is very interesting. He's walking to go to this guy's house to um, raise this guy's daughter who has died, and this lady touches him. Now, here's the thing. Jesus didn't even, she didn't say, hey, you know, could you heal me? I have an issue. Jesus didn't even know until she touched him, but he felt her touched him, okay? And this explains this story right here. You ever wonder why Jesus did miracles? You ever, you ever thought about that? I mean, why Jesus was on this earth to die for the sins of the world, to become the sacrifice for us and to whoever would believe on him, you know, would have everlasting life, right? But why did he have to go around for three and a half years and do all these miracles? You ever think about that? You say, okay, to show that he's God, right? Well, yeah, that's one reason. But there's a bigger picture here, all right? And th this story explains it. Notice what he says to this woman in verse number 22. He says to her, he says, Thy faith hath made thee whole. She didn't even ask him. She didn't ask him for permission. Hey, would you heal me, please? She didn't even ask him. She went and she touched him, and she had something, and it just, she was healed just like that. And Jesus explained what that something was, and it was her faith. Amen. It was her faith. Look back, look, to the man sick of the palsy. Jesus, I mean, the Bible says Jesus seeing their what? Their faith. To the centurion from chapter 8, he says, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a uh, faith. Amen. No, not in Israel. And then he heals his servant. You know, turn to uh, Matthew chapter 13. So there's something that's common here to these people that are getting healed, and it's their faith. And Jesus points it out. Let's look at the opposite of this. Let's look at the opposite of this. You say, I don't believe you. I don't like the connection. Let's look at the opposite. Look at Matthew 13 and verse 54. Jesus goes to his own hometown. He goes to his own county, or whatever you want to call it, where he's from. All right? And the Bible says, and he was come into his own country. He taught them there in the synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is this his mother not called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man had all these things? 
And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their what? Because of their unbelief. So he didn't do mighty works there because of their unbelief, which is the exact opposite of faith. So the faith caused the mighty works out of Jesus. So the lady that touched Jesus without even announcing herself to him, but she had the faith in her, in Jesus. You see, she believed on Jesus, and that is what healed her. So look, the people's faith came before healing, and the people didn't have faith here, so nothing was done. You see, he did not many mighty works there. This is a picture of your salvation. The miracles of Jesus are a picture, a foreshadowing of your salvation. That's why he did miracles. Faith was the source of healing. It was never, look, it was never through money or gifts or favor. Jesus just really liked these people. No, it was by faith. It was by faith. Look, for by grace are you saved through faith. So this, the miracles of Jesus are a picture of salvation. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 23. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house, now he's there, and saw minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all the land. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. So there's that faith again, right? So Jesus is going to heal these guys. And look at, he says to them, he says, Believe ye. And what are they, what's their answer? You know what their, an, if their answer is? Number one, yes, we believe that you can do it. But then what's the last word of their answer? Lord. They believed who he was too. So they believed he was the Lord. So there's that faith. Again, look at Matthew 9, verse 29. So we see that, that this, these miracles, I mean, they're just a picture again and again and again of salvation by grace through faith, period. All right? Look at verse 29. Then he touched, their, touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they departed, spread about his fame in all that country. And as they went out, behold, they brought him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. Now look, this is a little bit of a preview of the situation in Matthew chapter 12, where you know, we get this story of the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. All right? I'm not going to get into that story yet. We'll save that for Matthew chapter 12. But I just want to point out that you know, the Pharisees you know, basically made a habit of this. So when it happened in Matthew chapter 12, it wasn't like the first time it happened. Right? I mean, they were constantly saying, you know, following him around, he's doing all these great things, and they're saying that you know, he's, he's doing it by demons, he's doing it by Satan, he's doing it by the power of the devil, all this stuff. So by Matthew chapter 12, you know, he was fed up with it. All right, so that's a little bit of a context to Matthew chapter 12 when we get there. All right, accusing people of using the power to, of Satan to cast out, you know, Satan. But we'll get to that in Matthew 12. All right, look at verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Look, they were just, these people were confused. They were carried about in every way, no focus, no direction. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the sermon as well. But he had compassion on them. He had compassion on these people. Look at verse 37. And then, having compassion on those people, he says this. He says, Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's a good prayer. I mean, that's a prayer that we could pray. I mean, you should pray, you know, you should pray for this church to grow. You should pray for more people to become soul winners. Because the, har you know, the harvest truly is plenteous out there. 
All right? Fresno is a plenteous harvest. We see that week in and week out, we need more laborers, and we need more time. So we should pray for laborers and time. You know, I've said this many times, but soul winning is a function of man hours. You know, basically bodies out there doing it, bodies times time equals salvations, basically is what it is. So we need more laborers, we need more time. That's a good prayer to have, all right? So that's Matthew chapter 9. Let's look at some application of some of these stories in Matthew chapter 9. Look back at, you know, verse number 16. Verse number 16. I want to look at this idea of this new cloth onto an old garment and then this, you know, this new wine into old bottles. And what Jesus is talking about here is, you know, having one foot in the world, basically. You know, we teach separation here. And this is talking about having one foot in the world. And, you know, basically, it's not going to work out. It's, it's not going to work out where, you know, you're going to fall back into the world. All right? And, and especially in times like this, people need to be very, very careful. All right? Sin in general, turn to Luke chapter 11. Sin in general is a very, very dangerous thing for the Christian. All right? And you need to understand that sin is dangerous. And look at Luke chapter, 24, Luke chapter 11 and verse number 24. The Bible actually teaches that if there's something that, you know, you've gotten um, out of, you've gotten, you know, you've, you've gotten past in your life, you need to be very careful about especially that particular thing in your life. All right, look at Luke 11 and verse 24. The Bible says this, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and findeth none, he saith, I will return unto my house which I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taken to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, if you say this is confusing, let me just explain it to you. There's a whole sermon in this passage itself, but basically what the Bible is saying here, and I've seen this several times in my life, is if you get out of something, you get saved, you get out of sin, you get out, of, you know, you stop drinking or whatever you, your sin that you're struggling with, and then you fall back into that thing, it will be worse than it was the first time. And I've seen it many times. And it's very true. So look, you need to guard yourself. And you need to understand that, especially if you have struggled with something in the past, you need to put protections in, your, in place for yourself. Because... Being saved does not mean you don't still have the flesh. And the Bible says that if you fall back into those things, like, it will be worse than it was the first time. Because look, first of all, you're saved now. You're not getting away with anything. You're going to have the chastisement of God on your life. And, I mean, that enough right there. Put protections in place. Like, especially times like, like today. People are, are in a transitional period. They're, in, they're doing weird, different things now than they're used to. They're out of their routines that they've usually been in. Look, you just have to protect against those things that you know you struggle with and just sin in general. Just stay away from it. Because as a saved person, you fall back into those things. It could be worse than it was the first time. All right? Let's talk about just living in sin. You know, look, let's talk about somebody who wants to live in sin and, and fit in a church like this, for example. I mean, we preached a whole series on this when I, we first opened the church here. Look, it's not just fornication. I mean, everybody thinks about when you're living in sin, things that will get you kicked out of a church. It's fornication. There's all kinds of different things. Extortion. You know, taking advantage of people in a church. We talked about Christian extortion. You know, that kind of thing is, look, that's why God put these protections in place in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He put these protections in place that if you do certain things and you think you're going to come into a biblical church that has a candlestick in it, and you think you're going to live with these sins, look, God's not going to allow His bottle to break. You see what I mean? That's why it has to be that way. That's why these certain sins will get you kicked out of the church if a church is run properly and, and practices church discipline like the Bible says. They will get you thrown out. Because God's not going to allow his bottle to break. He's not going to allow his you know, clothing to get torn. It's going to be you that sin's going to do. 
you know, covetousness, being a railer, being a drunkard. drunkard. You know, 2 Thessalonians 3.14, by the way, says that if a man won't work, that we should not keep company with him. There's another one. Right? So these are serious sins that will literally get you thrown out of church. All right? Look, churches that don't practice proper discipline, that church tears. That bottle breaks. That's why you see these churches that allow just these anything goes churches, you see all these terrible things happening there. I mean, you see, you know, child molesters in the church, you see kids getting hurt, you see all these horrible things done there because the bottle will break. But Jesus says that against my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So that's why God puts these, these, these lines, these lines in, in the Bible. Finally tonight, look at verse uh, 35 and verse 36 of Matthew chapter 9. So we see that, you know, this half in, half out, not only is it dangerous for you, but it's not going to work. Your bottle's going to break. It's not going to work out for you. I mean, you're going to be a laughing stock to those people. You have one foot in out there, and you have one foot in here. You'll be a laughing stock to them. The bad always influences the good. That's, the, that's one of the biggest reasons that nobody should have their kid in public school. Because your, your child will never be an influence on the kids in the public school. It will always be the other way. Always. All right, look at verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and disease among the people. But he saw the multitude and was moved with compassion among them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Look, don't we see this today? <laughs> I mean, th today is such a great example of verse 36. I mean, don't we see just the unsaved, just completely confused and, and scared? And they're just, they're just I mean, they're, it says they fainted, right? I mean, people, I mean, you can hear, you can read all sorts of things about how stressed out and depressed people are now. I mean, I'm sure, you know, the 80% increase in drinking or alcohol consumption is not helping that situation either. But look. All these people out there are confused. They're scattered like sheep having no shepherd. This is why I said to Brother Frank the other day when we were out soul winning, I think we're going to get a huge spiritual bounce out of this thing. I mean, I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced that when this thing starts, you know, whatever coming, I don't even know what it'll look like on the outside of this thing. But look, we're going to get a bounce out of this thing. Because people, people that were thought they were whole, the people that thought they were whole and thought that they had it all figured out, you know what? A lot of those people are still going to think that they still have it all figured out. But some of them are going to be looking for something different. They're going to be looking for what their conscience is telling them that they need. They're going to be looking for that hope that we can provide. You know, maybe a few more of these people, after going through these uncertain times and being scared and stressed out and depressed and drunk, Maybe a few more of these people will realize that they need a shepherd. Maybe a few of these people that were just thinking before all this happened that, you know what, I need to get in church. How many, how many times have you heard that at the door? Do you go to church? No, but I need to. And you never see them again. Maybe some of those people, when they get, you know, shooken up a little bit, maybe some of those people will realize, you know what, I, I, I need to do that. You know what, I need to, they pick up an invitation to Verity Baptist Church and they realize, you know what, today is the day because I don't know what's coming tomorrow. And look, people, I mean, people are scared. They're, they're depressed. They're stressed out. We're going we're gonna to get a bounce out of this and we need to be ready for that. People are going to be yearning for a church. They're going to be yearning for answers. They're going to be yearning for what? The hope the hope that we can give them. Because look, at the end of the day, I mean, what is your hope? At the end of the day, God's will be done. At the end of the day, you're saved. At the end of the day, I'm saved. At the end of the day, whatever. We're going to heaven. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to be fine. And, and what do we do now? What do we do now? Well, we do what we're just supposed to do. That's it. 
We do what we were always supposed to do. So we know. We know what to do through times like this. We know what to fear through times like this. We fear God, like we feared him before this, and like we'll fear him after this. It's really simple for the saved Christian. It's really simple. And when you don't have to worry about all these different things, well, which direction we should go, we know the direction we should go. You don't have to be stressed out about it. You just go that way. And whatever, you know, the Bible says go that way, and whatever happens, we just keep going that way. There's no decision. There's no, what do I do now? It's just, we just go that way. That's it. It's so easy. I mean, it's so easy. People are going to want that when this whole thing's done. And, you know, uh, Americans, Americans, some of these Americans need to be brought down a little bit. And, and there will be a spiritual bounce that comes out of it. And I, I do believe that. They'll be looking for, you know, they'll be looking for fellowship. You know what makes me feel so much better? Just fellowship. Amen. You know, no matter what stupid, crazy thing is going on, when I come here and we just have just fellowship, just everything's better. Amen. People want that. I'm convinced, look, I'm convinced overall that people, people want a church like this. Yeah, that people want a Bible preaching church. That people, look, I've seen for 20, 25 years, I've seen people lose their kids to the world. Unsaved people. Unsaved people lose their kids to the world. They have no idea. You know, they don't like it because guess what? They, they have a conscience. They're not reprobates, right? They don't like that their kids are going into fornication and drug and alcohol use. They don't like that. Over and over and over, 14, 15, 16 years old, they just go into that stuff because they're off in the world with the public school system. People want a church like this. I'm convinced of it. You will never convince me otherwise. People want it. They just don't know that they don't know that it's possible to raise godly children. They don't know that it's possible to have a godly marriage. They don't know that it's possible to live the victorious Christian life minus all these problems that these people are dealing with, that this, this sin that people are dealing with and the consequences of it. So look, we need to be ready for that. We need to be ready to go out and tell these people. And we need to be ready for this place to grow. We need to be ready to, you know, show people the hope that's in us. Because it's coming. And I can feel it coming. Okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Matthew chapter 9. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book in the Bible. We thank you for uh, Matthew chapter 9 and all the different um, doctrines that you teach in just this one chapter, Lord. We thank you for all the miracles and all the wonderful things that you did when you were on this earth and just all the things that, you know, they, they, they edify us, all these stories and all these things that you did in, in your ministry, Lord. We'll never stop learning from that, those few years of ministry that you had on this earth. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this church. We thank you for everyone in it. Please um, just put the hand of God um, on this church. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.